going back to that Hillsdale student you met in the mid 2000s, perhaps when you were over, you know, for ISI in at Oxford. Do you think? I'm curious what she meant by, uh, or this assumption, or this presupposition she had that to be a consistent conservative, you'd have to be Roman Catholic. Was she speaking uh, about the fact that she was attempting to conserve, conserve something prior to the Reformation? Or was it the fact that so many of uh, the thinkers of the conservative movement, like a Buckley and others, were Roman Catholic that that seemed to be for Catholic reasons or both. Maybe it's all of the above that some of their thinking is based on natural law arguments and other theology that is derived from a more ancient or medieval right. context. Is it, did, did, was she operating at that level uh, or, or I'm curious right. uh, what her conversation <sighs> partners were or what she intended by that comment. My sense is that it's all the above that um, there are, these figures like Russell Kirk, who um, was a conservative actually before he became Roman Catholic. So there's that. And that's a little bit of a wrinkle in the in the mix. He wrote the famous best-selling book, The uh, Conservative Mind, I believe in 1953. And I don't think he converted to Roman Catholicism until 1964. But he would be someone who is a staple here in certain history classes. We have a professorship in the history department named for Kirk. Um, So that would be part of it that people like Kirk and William F. Buckley, these Roman Catholics were big parts of the conservative movement. It would also be, though, you mentioned natural law, I think pulling on the John Courtney Murray tradition of trying to locate the American founding in a natural law tradition. And even Richard John Newhouse did this, I think, in the um, the book, The Catholic Moment, published in the mid 80s, where I think he tried to say that the recovery of um, the American founding would rely, needed, say, to recover a natural law tradition and that Roman Catholics were in the best position to maintain that tradition as opposed to yeah. Protestants. And then on top of all that, I think this student may have been reflecting on her own study of literature, history, philosophy at Hillsdale, where you can see um, a debt that the modern era has to the medieval world and the ancient worlds, and even the American founding, the way we teach it here, you can see a debt to the ancient and medieval worlds, in addition to the pre-modern, early modern world of the Reformation. So again, it's not a neat easy story of the way this plays out. And it's one of the reasons why I like to teach all this material, because you can isolate some of the arguments that are going on even within this this development. But I could imagine her also putting these pieces together of the, develop, the development of the West and how America comes out of that as thinking, you know, this is part of the way to keep this interest in and admiration for the American founding going is by um, becoming Roman Catholic. But of course, as we were saying earlier, to any Protestant or even most Roman Catholics in the 1950s and even the 1960s, they'd be saying, that doesn't make any sense that you would go to Roman Catholicism to um, to keep, keep alive the American political tradition. Even John F. Kennedy in his famous speech to the Baptist ministers in in Houston in September of 1960. He makes a really smart play. And of course, he didn't write the speech himself alone. Ted uh, Sorensen helped a lot with this, but he makes a really interesting play there to the Virginia Baptist tradition and the importance of separation in uh, church and state. A lot of Baptists, obviously, in Texas. And this was a way of him appealing to that side of the American tradition of separation of church and state. And he will say in that speech that he believes in the absolute separation of church and state. I mean, it's something that um, is so foreign to the way that even president Biden is now covered by in places like the New York, New York times or, or the Washington post or, or New Yorker magazine. I mean, they kind of celebrate his Roman Catholic faith 
of course, it's a very progressive Pope <laughs> Francis kind yeah. of, you know, global sure. uh, climate change and all kind of progressive um, yeah. stuff that goes with it. Economic but nobody equality. is worried mm -hmm. about conflating church and state these days. I mean, even the um, Americans United for Separation of Church and State, which used to be a fair, fairly Baptist and libertarian organization, is now they're much more worried about proponents of religious freedom. Religious freedom is really a cover for getting religion back in. Meanwhile, <laughs> President Biden is meeting with the Pope, right. and that's just great because they agree they agree on climate. Mm -hmm. Oh, well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean— we could spend weeks talking about Francis. Uh, you know, for me, he's very interesting uh, as a, a Jesuit coming. When I see some of the things he says theologically, it certainly makes sense to me, having spent so much time reading and thinking about Karl Rahner, but for others people mm. who might have preferred, you know, Benedict and uh, uh, what was thought to be more of a Catholic's Catholic, uh, you know, that it, it seems like it's coming out of left field. But it's right. a, you have these different strands uh, and and completely different, oddly enough, as odd as this may sound, very different traditions within Roman Catholicism, which could be confusing for folks.